Okay, so today we're going to be uh, doing a three-part lecture. Uh, the first part will be a continuation of uh, what we didn't cover last time on autoregressive models. Um, then we're going to talk about one of the primary applications of autoregressive models, which is lossless compression. Um, so you'll learn how that works, you'll learn how to implement it, and you'll learn how to turn autoregressive models into compressors. And then we're going to talk about flows, which are another class of likelihood-based models that are tailored for continuous data. And they can do cool stuff, too. All right, so let's, let's start with the first part, which is um, continuing what, with our discussion on our regressive models. Um, so if you remember, there's this model called the Pixel CNN. This is an autoregressive model expressly designed to work well for images. Um, what that means is that, well, an autoregressive model is supposed to first pick an ordering over the variables in, in question. So here the variables are the pixels in the image. Um, and it's supposed to predict one variable given all the previous ones. So in a pixel CNN is designed so that this conditional, uh, th this prediction structure is given by convolutions. And this is a good idea because we know convolutions work very well for images. Um, so what's going to happen is, if this is an image, um, in order to predict this pixel right here, the pixel CNN will compute some kind of statistics or some kind of features that are based on pixels that are to the left and above the current pixel. And it will use that to, to compute, say, the logits of some softmax distribution um, right at that pixel. And this will be true for every pixel in the image. This masking structure will be respected. And by doing so, you can add up all the log probabilities, and you can get the joint log probability for the model in a single forward pass. So that's, that's the pixel CNN. Um, and you guys are implementing that. Um, we saw that. The standard pixel CNN, the masking-based pixel CNN, which you guys are implementing, um, while it is simple, relatively simple to implement, it does have a problem, which is a blind spot. Uh, what that means is that as you, as you stack more pixel CNN layers on top of each other, well, the receptive field grows. This always happens with convolutional neural nets. But because of the way the masking is designed, th there's a certain region of, of pixels which will never be accessed by the current pixel. And this is a problem because autoregressive models are supposed to be conditioned on every previous pixel. You must have that property in order to capture all possible distributions over data. So that means that these models are actually weak. They're, they're not able to capture all joint distributions over data. Um, now there's a fix to that. Um, this is called the gated pixel CNN. The way this fix works is, well, I won't describe it here, but the, the fix works by st stacking or de dealing with two streams of convolutions at once, one of which is responsible for conditioning on the left, to the left, and the other one is responsible for con conditioning above. And if you combine everything in just the right way, you can actually get a receptive field that grows in a way that has no blind spots. So that's pretty cool. And it's all based on convolutions. Um, and, of course, you can apply some standard tricks you know from neural nets to make things work even better. So you can add these fancy residual blocks. And, and really, the, the reason why you do this is because the performance is better empirically. Now, we also saw, just going along the lines of improving these autoregressive models, uh, we saw that using these categorical distributions for the outputs, is kind of redundant. And it also throws away some information. Namely that it throws away that two, the, the information that two nearby pixel intensities, say 254 and 255, they should be similar to each other. But a categorical distribution doesn't know about this. And so one way you can fix this is by using a distribution that actually knows about distance in intensity space. So one example, so th this is a construction that works really well empirically. It's called a mixture of logistic distributions. Um, I think the, the details are not too relevant right now. The point is that this distribution knows that nearby intensity values 
are actually next to each other. So if you increase the probability of one intensity value, chances are the probability of a nearby one will increase too. Whereas for a softmax, that's not necessarily true. Um, there, there are even more architectural extensions you can make. There's this fancy, cool architecture called a UNet, which is a certain kind of convolutional neural net that lets you process multiple resolutions at the same time. Um, and you can apply the same idea to pixel CNNs. Again, the details don't matter. The point is that you can think really hard about architectures to improve performance, just as you can with, with neural nets for supervised learning. And you can see that if you do all this stuff, you get great performance. That's nice. All right. So one, one architecture design that is probably, I, I personally think is one of the most interesting ways of, uh, interesting architecture design choices that uh, I've seen out of the neural net literature is this concept of attention. And attention has actually seen relatively slow um, adoption in the generative modeling uh, literature, but people are starting to use it a bit more. Um, so attention is a way of defining a neural net architecture where each output can see everything. It can see every single input. So to think about why this might be necessary, um, we know that in order for one output pixel of a pixel CNN layer to see many input pixels, as it should, because we, we want that for the full autoregressive dependency structure, you actually need a lot of layers, right? The, the receptive field essentially grows by one pixel at a time, or something like that, for every layer that you add. Uh, so what that means is that the path from, say, pixel one in the top left to the pixel in the bottom right is actually very long. It's, it, Generally, we, we use this heuristic, which is that if it takes a lot of layers for information to propagate, then that's going to be very hard to learn. Um, and and that, that is how pixel CNNs work. So while they do have the capability of having fully expressive receptive fields, it is hard for them to express that, even if they can. And this is where attention comes in. So attention is, or self-attention, is an architecture choice, is, is an architecture design that in a single layer gives each pixel an unlimited receptive field. Now that might seem too good to, too good to be true, and it kind of is, and the problem is that it's really slow. But if, if, you're, if you're willing to suffer that speed penalty, then it really is able to capture information from the entire receptive field in one layer. And what's nice about this, well, you, you might imagine, well, you could do this with a multi-layer perceptron. Right? This is kind of the, the whole point of them. Everything is connected to everything. Uh, but the problem with multi-layer perceptrons is that the number of parameters grows with the dimension of data. And that's not going to work out for us uh, because for, for high dimensional data. Um, the nice thing about attention is that the number of parameters is constant. Uh, and it's independent of the data the data dimension. Um, and also, another nice thing about it is that the computation for each pixel can be done in parallel, just like pixel CNN computations can be done in parallel. Um, so, for example, you might argue that RNNs have the same property. They do have constant parameter scaling uh, compared to the data dimension, and they also ha technically have an unlimited receptive field, as long as you're careful that gradients don't vanish. But they're not parallelizable. You, you cannot compute the, the, you must loop individually over the different pixels um, to get all the outputs. OK, so what is attention? Um, I, I think it's good to see this at least once, um, because this, this attention building block is um, a core building block of, I think, pretty much every state of the art model. Um, in, in, or many state-of-the-art models out there. Um, this is how it works. Um, so I guess what's going on over here is think of these three things over here as input pixels of an image. And so what you do in attention is 
you apply an, a neural net, an MLP, to each input, to each input pixel independently. And that MLP will take each, in, each input pixel and turn it into a pair of vectors, a key and a value. And, and this, it's important to note that the same MLP is used for every time step, for every pixel here. Um, that way, the number of parameters doesn't grow with the number of pixels. And so once you compu compute these keys and values, you can now define an operation on top of them called attention. And the way this operation works is you plug in a query vector. This is just another vector that comes from somewhere. And you take the dot product against all keys. So here, you imagine you have all the pixels. So you get a bunch of keys. And now for your query vector, you take the dot product against all keys. So it's like you're, you're like querying every possible key. You're, you're checking how, how much does your query align with each key. And you normalize that into a distribution. And then you use those weights to form a convex combination of the values. So what this operation does is it takes the, takes the query and it looks up sort of the most associated pixel in the input according to similarity by the key. And it uses that to extract the corresponding value. So you can see that this is an operation that can see all input pixels. Given a query, it'll loop over all possible input pixels and uh, extract the appropriate value. So, so that's, that's what attention does for a given query. Now, there's, now what you do to turn this into a building block for autoregressive models is instead of having this fixed query, you now have each one of the input pixels also generate their own queries. So now each input pixel generates a key, a value, and a query. And each input pixel uses its query to query everybody else. And you do this separately, and this is parallelizable for every pixel. And that generates, the, these, these convex combinations are the outputs for the next layer. So, yes? Yeah, so that's what will happen at the first layer. At the next layer, everything will be, it'll, it'll be exactly that. You just input, yeah. Um, they, there are actually multiple choices you can make. You, you could also embed them into a higher dimensional space and then apply this operation. Um, in any case, at the first layer will have to be kind of special because of that. At subsequent layers, the dimensions will stay the same. They, they'll be some kind of high dimensional object, 128. And so this is just a diagram of um, the receptive field. So if you imagine this is the output and this is the input, if you apply a convolution, then the receptive field for that convolution at this pixel is these, these, uh, these pixels over here. Whereas with the attention mechanism, because each, each pixel is taking a dot product with its query compared to all, yes? Uh, can you go one slide back? Yeah, yeah. So the, the key and the value, they're both, they're both vectors? Yes. Okay. Yes. And we learn them from like, like each pixel has like three values, RGB, and how, like what dimensionality is the K vector and the B vector? Right, so one, I think the, maybe the right way to say this is the best thing to do is at the first layer, the, the pixel will be three dimensional, it's red, green, and blue, then it's probably best to project it into a higher dimensional space. You can do this using a one-by-one one convolution, right? So you can turn this uh, vector of dimension three, three-dimensional vector, into say a 128-dimensional vector. Um, and then now you apply this pointwise MLP to every pixel to generate the key query and value. So the output of that will be 128 times three. 128 dimensions for the key, 128 for, for the query, and 128 for the value. And then now you can apply this operation. All, all, the, all the shapes match up then. Right? So the queries and the keys, um, they're, they're dot products, so the vectors have to be the same dimension. They're all 128. Then you get a bunch of scalars. That's what, that's what this uh, fraction is. 
and then you take a convex combination of the, v of the Vs, and those are all 128 dimensional. Yes. Or, yes. No? Okay. You. Uh, what do you mean by uniform? Uh, no, you, you want to use, uh, well, keys, queries, and values are determined by a function. They're determined by a pointwise multilayer perceptron applied to each input time step. In other words, it's a one-by-one -one convolution. What is the, what is the perceptron taken as input? The previous layer. Right, it, it's a one-by-one -one convolution. Oh. So, so you, take the, you take the input image, apply a one-by-one -one convolution to get all the keys, queries, and values. That'll be in the channel dimension. Um, and then you apply this operation, and then you can do the same thing with the next one by one convolution. That'll generate new keys, queries, and values for the next layer. Yes? Do you lose all the spatial information? Uh, yes, you do lose spatial information. That's very important. Um, yeah, thanks for bringing that up. Um, so this, one funny thing about this operation is that if you permute the input pixels, so if you take these pixels here and you permute them, then the outputs will permute the same way. Right, so this thing doesn't know anything about space. Um, and that's a huge problem for images where, let's say, uh, permuting the pixels really destroys the image. So you want to know about spatial information. And so there's a very simple fix to that. All you have to do is concatenate an extra channel. And that channel, or let's say two channels, and those two channels specify position, right? You, you can just add a new channel that specifies the x position and a new channel that specifies the y position. And that just completely fixes the problem. There's also another way to fix the problem, which we'll get to later. Yeah? So if our uh, input and output sequences are like unbounded, like with sentences, yeah. then this would be pretty bad, right? Well. Yes, so the, okay. the, the amount of time that it takes this, uh, yeah, so really each output pixel can see every input pixel, and so that means if you want to compute this, you really have to see every input pixel. Um, there's no getting around that. Um, what you can try to do is limit the receptive field of the attention. Um, you can do that for computational reasons, and uh, we will also do that for an even better reason. By limit the receptive field, do you mean like limit the total amount of waiting that it takes yeah, to wait? Yeah, exactly, the exactly. So you will force some of these connections to be zero. So not, okay, so it can't just give one of them like, all of them like 1.001%, you'll like force it to give a bunch of them zero. Right, okay. and the rest will sum to one, yes. Okay. And so that's exactly what this is about. Uh, so one reason to do masking, this is called masking, where you take these weights and you force them to be zero in some places. I'll, I'll describe what, what this weird notation means in a second. Um, but right now, attention connects everything to everything. That's great if you want to see all your inputs, but it's not so great for autoregressive models. We know that autoregressive models must connect each pixel to previous ones only and not future ones. So what are you supposed to do in this situation? Well, it turns out that it's extremely easy to force attention to not look at certain pixels. Um, all you have to do is take, take this score, this query times key, this query dot product key, and you turn it into an extremely small number. Just make it minus infinity. So why does this work? If you, if you take that number and make it minus infinity, um, e to the minus infinity, or some very small number, is going to be zero. Um, and so now, if you compute this sum, this weighted sum, um, the weight for that vector which is masked out will be zero. And the rest will be normalized appropriately. All right, so really, this is, this is just the trick to mask things out in... Um, in a way that you can compute in a parallelized fashion using CUDA kernels, using 
TensorFlow operations in a vectorized fashion. But you know, if this looks confusing, all, all you have to know is that what, what this operation does is that, um, say for this pixel or, or this pixel here, all it will do is take these three arrows and delete them. That, that, that's, that's that idea expressed in TensorFlow code. Okay. So in addition to having some nice properties like being able to see the maximal possible receptive field, you can also do fancier things with attention. Um, for example, you can order the pixels in this zigzag order and you can apply attention and you, and, and you can create an autoregressive model out of this with pixels ordered this way. Now notice this is extremely hard to do with um, the pixel CNN architecture. At least I can't really think of a way. If you can think of a way, that'd be great. But I, it seems quite hard to think of a, a masking pattern for convolutions that respects this autoregressive ordering. But with attention, it's super easy to do. All you have to do is, well, write down the pixels in that order and apply attention. And you're done. Yes? In practice, how much does the ordering that you use actually matter? In that's a good question. Um, I'm actually not the right person to ask about that. Um, I do know that for, we, we'll, we'll talk about this later in this lecture, there are other models called flow models which have similar properties in them. It's not exactly ordering, but it's some kind of um, dependency structure. And for those models, uh, that dependency structure, which is analogous to this, is extremely crucial. Um, that, that can be the difference between a model that gets state-of-the-art performance versus a model that, you know, it doesn't even come near. So, yeah, it does matter. Um, I think there was another question. Yes? So, like, a difference in orderings would be the ordering for pixel CNN that we saw last time that looks like this. Right. And, like, a complex ordering would be, like, this is the exact pattern. And right. And that can lead to, like, a really huge difference in performance. So I can tell you that having a bad ordering will completely destroy performance. But uh, is it a bad ordering that's still autoregressive? Yes, okay. yes. OK, so uh, yeah, th this is a good point. It's actually very easy to manufacture bad orderings that yield perfectly good autoregressive models. All you have to do is pick a fixed permutation, a fixed random permutation of the pixels, and choose that to be your ordering. Right? You, you, can, you can say that, like, uh, this pixel comes first, and then this pixel comes next, and then this pixel comes next, and so on. And you can just choose that to be your ordering. Now, is that a good idea? Well, that's actually a really bad idea. And it's because you completely lose the inductive bias that you get out of this standard ordering. So what is the inductive bias here? Well, it's that given, given the pixels you're conditioning on, you must be able to easily predict the next pixel. So if the pixels you're conditioning on are some contiguous patch, well, it seems very plausible that a neural net can, pre can predict a pixel that's on the boundary of that patch, right? So if you choose an autoregressive ordering that looks like this, or like the standard raster uh, line ordering, that property is satisfied. Everything, everything that's being conditioned on is a contiguous patch. And the thing you're trying to predict is just a pixel on the boundary. But if you choose a random permutation, then that's not necessarily true anymore. Right? You, you might see some scattered dots that you're conditioning on, and you're asked to predict a pixel that's very far away from them. That's going to be a very hard task. OK. So as you can probably guess, you can uh, combine all these things, right? The, these are, well, one of the points we want to deliver to you in this class is that all these things we're teaching you about are building blocks for models. Uh, there, there's no set way to design anything. Um, and what you should do is pick all these building blocks and try all of them uh, to see what works on your task. So it turns out that what works really well, extremely well for density modeling for images is to, is to stack attention with pixel CNN blocks. So you, you, you just stack them on top of each other and you interleave them. Uh, that's it. 
Um, and so the, the reason this is a good idea is, well, we know that pixel CNNs are able to see entire receptive fields, but as I said before, they can only do so through many layers. This is, this is because it takes one layer to, an additional layer to grow the receptive field. So it turns out that it's actually kind of hard for pixel CNNs to see anything. So here, this plot here is um, the gradient of this output pixel with respect to all the input pixels. So this gives you a sense of the sensitivity of this out the, the distribution for this output pixel with respect to the inputs. And you see that the most sensitive um, input pixels are these. So while the receptive field is supposed to be everything, effectively this pixel can only see these pixels. So that's a weak structure, yes? Isn't that a good thing? I mean, isn't most information about this pixel stored in the like, post binary? Yeah, that is true. On the other hand, it does make the model not fully expressive. Because we do know that if we want it to um, match, we, if we want it to be able to express all possible joint distributions, it has to be able to condition on everything it sees. We can't, in principle, condition on everything? In principle, okay, so th this is a really good point. So in principle, it can. It's just kind of hard to do it. Because in order for it to do that, it must transmit information across many layers. So is this a uh, result, or like, I'm not exactly sure what yeah. this figure is from, but is this from a situation where indeed, like, information is spread uniformly across all pixels of the bug? Um, no, no, okay. So this, this image was, I believe, was generated uh, by taking a randomly initialized model of this architecture. Uh, so th these are the, this is at initialization without training. Uh, and this is the gradient of this output pixel with respect to the input pixels. So this tells you at, th this gives you a sense of what this model is biased to do. This model is biased to only look at these pixels. Right? Th this is what it's, what's most natural for it to do. Um, if you look at the more improved pixel CNN versions like pixel CNN++, you see that this, th this receptive field is larger. So it's kind of able, it's more biased to access more information. And well, if you add attention, then you see that it's more biased to see everything, which is nice. What's up with the upper right? Yeah, it's not perfect. <laughs> yeah. So pixel CNN does not have self-attention, right? Why do you have No. Why is it better than pixel CNN? Uh, uh, this, this does, this model on the right does. Uh, the middle one? Yeah. Okay. Uh, oh, yeah. So, um, all I can say is that <laughs> um, the model in the middle was uh, designed by somebody who knows what he's doing. So, th there are a lot of choices you can make that are not just about the, the masking structure, right? There, there are choices like how exactly do you set up the residual connections? How exactly do you initialize the network? Um, yeah, so all, all of these things do matter. I hope that was a satisfying answer. Okay. All right, and as you can see, if you add attention and do all these things, you get, uh, the, this is actually the state-of-the-art density estimation performance on CIFAR. Okay, so this ends our tour of autoregressive models and the, the way to design their architectures. Um, autoregressive models are really great at one thing, or possibly many things, but one thing that they're, that they're especially great at is getting good log likelihoods. They, uh, I would say that if you have some data set and the only thing you want to do is get a really good log likelihood on it, in other words, be able to compress it very well, then you should train an autoregressive model. These simply are the best across, I think, pretty much all data sets that I can think of. Um, and this makes sense because this, the way autoregressive models are set up are that they're able to capture all joint distributions over data um, because of the way the distribution is factorized. And also, if you choose the ordering properly, then you'll have a good inductive bias. Right? It'll be easy to predict one pixel given all pixels right next to it. It'll be easy to predict one word given all words before it. So 
everything kind of makes sense here. But they're not perfect. I think as you guys are working through the homework assignment, you'll find that sampling from an autoregressive model is painfully slow. This is because sampling a single pixel is an entire forward pass through the network. Um, so to give you a reference for a pixel CNN, uh, on, I guess, an older GPU, it takes 11 minutes to generate a little mini batch of 32 by 32 images. So if, if you're interested in generating data using these large autoregressive models, you're going to have to wait a very long time. And this is pretty much infeasible for, for use in practice. So well, it turns out that it is sometimes possible to speed it up a little bit. So earlier, we were kind of uh, drawing a separation between recurrent neural networks and these masking-based models. Um, and we did so because it's easy to present that way. Uh, but it kind of turns out that autoregressive models can be interpreted as certain kinds of recurrent networks that discard activations as time goes on. So if you think of it that way, uh, I won't go into the details, but if you think of it that way, it's possible to write down an algorithm that caches activations and avoids recomputing them. Um, and by doing so, you can speed up the sampling performance by a bit. Um, it's still very slow, though, even if you do this kind of trick. There's another way that you can speed up sampling from autoregressive models, and it's to make them not fully autoregressive. So that seems like a kind of um, unsatisfying answer, but in practice, it can actually work decently well. Um, so this is an example of a certain autoregressive ordering, which is not fully autoregressive. Um, and the point of doing this is that once it's not fully autoregressive, you can start making predictions in parallel. Um, and you can take sam compute samples in parallel. And once you have that, you get a speed up. So this is, uh, this is an example called, I, I believe it's called parallel pixel CNN. Um, this is a dependency structure that's designed to make sense for images and yet allow for faster sampling. And finally, there's, uh, I guess, people sometimes commonly say that autoregressive models, while they get very good density estimation performance, still don't sample very well. Turns out that that's not entirely true either. Um, it's possible to play some tricks by messing around with the data and messing around with the architecture in order to get pretty decent samples that are at least for CIFAR, on, on the level of, uh, that seem comparable to GANs, which are generally known to be the best sample generating generative models. Um, and yeah, here, here are some images. Okay, that concludes this, if there are no more questions, that concludes this first part of the lecture. Cool. All right, so Peter will now talk about compression. Now we're going to take a little bit of a sidestep from neural network models and look at one of the application domains of unsupervised learning, which is compression. So if you want to read more about compression, this is a good reading to uh, read through. And a lot of this lecture is based on what's in uh, this is about 45 pages on compression uh, that kind of starts from scratch. So. What is compression and why might we care? Well, maybe, hold on, iPad. Okay, so what is compression? Uh, the idea is that we want to reduce the number of bits that we send maybe over a channel or something compared to the original number of bits that we started with. So this might be for images, for speech, for music, and so forth. For example, um, you have some bits coming in, then you have your compressor. Compressor turns it into a new set of bits. That new set of bits is not really what you want on the other side, so then you need to use a decompressor to reverse that operation and get back out what you originally wanted to send, be it music or speech or video. Why would you care um, and not just send the original bits? Um, well, there's a few reasons. You might save time and bandwidth this way, because you might, if you do it well, have to send less bits, which you can get across more quickly and it might cost you money to send things over your channel. Or if you're maybe storing a lot of things, you could store less bits in your storage system and have cheaper storage costs than if you did not compress. 
Now, within compression, there is really two broad categories. There is lossless compression and lossy compression. In lossless compression, once you go through this entire process, you get back out exactly what you started from. That will also limit how much you can compress things if you want to get back out exactly what you started from. An alternative is to go lossy, where you're happy to get something back out that's not exactly what you started from, but somehow you consider it close enough and you're happy with it. And that allows you often to compress a lot more. In some later lectures, we'll look at lossy compression. Today, we'll be fully focused on lossless, where what comes back out should be exactly a reconstruction of what we started from. What are some applications that you might be familiar with? Essentially, tons and tons of file formats that you're familiar with use compression underneath to reduce the amount of storage and amount of communication needed to work with those files. And then also many um, communication systems do compression under the hood to send things across more effectively. Also, who here watches uh, um, Silicon Valley HBO show? This thing here, good number of people. So also these guys do compression. Um, they do lossless compression, they claim with something called middle out algorithm, which unfortunately we're not able to cover today because um, nobody knows what it is. Um, but some real world startups have tried to um, get close. So this is an actual company, apparently, Piper Pied. Um, the name of the Silicon Valley TV show company is Pied Piper with the two words reversed. And they actually showcased their compression algorithms here uh, at TechCrunch Disrupt, I think last year or a couple years ago. Um, now, they, they actually, this company does lossy compression, playing some tricks where essentially they reconstruct really well around the faces and allow a lot of loss when you're away from the faces, which is a clever trick you can play to reduce the number of bits you need to send, and people are still happy with what they get on the other side. Um, but today we're going to look at lossless. First question you could ask is, can you do this universally? Like, can you have a compressor that no matter what you give to it, is going to make something smaller? And then later you decompress it and you have your original back. Who thinks you can build a machine like that, universal machine? Nobody? Oh, too bad. Nobody has any ideas how to do this. Um, <laughs> well, it would be really cool if you had an idea how to do it. Um, but the proposition on the slides is that this is not possible. And we'll look at a simple argument by contradiction. So, imagine you have a universal data compression algorithm U that can compress every bit stream possible. Given some bit string B0, compress it, get the smaller bit string B1. Well, B1 is still a bit stream, so you can apply this thing again to get a smaller bit string B2. You can apply this again. Ult ultimately, you reach zero. And we know that if all you end up with is zero all the time, there's no way to reconstruct uh, what you started from. So that's one way to prove that this is not possible. It's a bit like perpetuum mobile is not possible for compression. Universal compression is not possible, at least not. Um, in a lossless way. Another way to look at it is in some sense the same way, but more formally tied into counting. If you say, okay, I have a thousand bit long bit strings that I want to compress, well, that means there's two to the 1,000 possible strings I might want to consider compressing. And if I am required to use less than 1,000 bits to do that, and I count out how many different things can I encode with less than 1,000 bits, you'll see that you're not able to encode every possible 2 to 1,000 bit streams, which means there's no way you can compress everything and then still reconstruct on the other side. Why is compression then possible at all, given we can't do it universally? Well, here's an example to give you some intuition. Kind of a cool result uh, about statistical patterns in data. Um, I'll give you a minute to read this. So who is able to read this? Pretty much everyone. Um, if you weren't able to read it, what it said is that you can swap the order of the letters in a word as long as you keep the first two letters and the last two letters the same, and most people are going to be able to still read and understand fully what's in the text, no problem. So what that shows is that there's a lot of redundancy in the letters that we get across when we write text, and that redundancy should probably be exploitable in some way. Same with images. Look at the image on the left, beautiful flower. Um, 
Once a pixel is yellow, you probably know the one next door is likely going to be yellow too. Same for green. Image on the right is completely random. And if your data distribution looks like the one on the right, then you don't have any patterns to exploit to compress your data. So we don't have a universal losses compressor, but we do have an intuition that if there are statistical patterns, maybe we can compress data. What does it even mean to compress? So first thing we need to do is code up some original symbol and turn it into some other symbol. Text, how is it done? You have characters and you turn them into a sequence of seven bits. That's called ASCII. And here's the ASCII table showing the 128 different characters that can be encoded with ASCII. It's very easy for encoding and decoding. You just look at the table, generate your seven bits, then your seven bits come in, next seven bits come in every time you match it to the table, get out the character corresponding to it. Issue with this is that you can't really get any benefit from this because every character, no matter how frequent, no matter how predictable it was that was going to be next, is going to use the same number of bits. So what we need is some kind of um, coding where you vary the length of the code depending on how frequently a certain symbol might be sent. And if the symbol is very frequent, hopefully the code is very short. This symbol is very infrequent. You're okay with a longer code because you don't have to use that long code all that often. Well, once you have variable length code, there's a question how to avoid ambiguity because now you can't just say the first seven came in, I know how to decode. You have to somehow know once you've gotten a bunch of bits that that's a code word for something you can decode and then go to the next one. So there's multiple ways of doing it. The simplest way, and that we'll consider for now, is to use prefix codes. So prefix codes are codes where no two code words. So hold on. If you have code word A, code word B, it's not possible that code word A which is shorter than B, is the beginning of code word B. So you can never be confused once you've seen a code word that it might still have to continue to complete into another code word. So, how can you achieve this? To have code words that are easy to disambiguate, you could have a stop character at the end. And if that's a dedicated type of character, then you know whenever you see that, it ended, and you cannot confuse it with still needing to continue decoding to get your symbol. Or you could have a prefix tree code, which we'll see some examples of, and which is the more typical scenario. So long before internet and everything we use today to communicate, there used to be, uh, I think it's called telegraphs. Um, and what you would do there is you communicate by sending signals over a line by alternating between a dot and a little line. A dot corresponds to a very short signal you send. A line is a longer signal, but then also there are pauses in between them. And the pause between dot and line within a single letter is shorter than the pause you insert between one letter to the next letter. And so this longer pause from letter to letter is essentially that stop symbol. It's encoded in a pause rather than an actual symbol you send, but it's still the same thing. It's just another type of symbol encoded as a pause. And what you see here in Morse is that the letters don't all have the same duration. And that corresponds to the notion that some letters are more frequent than other ones. And so you want them to be quicker to communicate um, if they're more frequent. How about the prefix codes? So prefix free codes are in one-to-one -one correspondence with binary trees or tries. Um, Supposedly, trees comes from retrieval, and then that's why some people say trees, but then there's also trees with two E's, and then to this ambiguous, some people say tries, but these are the, what it essentially means is a tree where on every split, you have hard-coded that going to the left means a zero and going to the right means a one, rather than explicitly putting information on the edges on the splits. So. These binary trees are ways of encoding symbols in a sequence of zeros and ones. Here's an example. Here is a code word table. And here is the corresponding tree representation. For example, if all we send across is zero, that corresponds to A. But if we want to send across B, then we'd have to send a one, followed by a one, followed by a one, followed by a one. If your encoding table matches to a binary tree and 
no two symbols end up in the same leaf, then you have a uniquely de decodable code that's very easy to decode. When a, something comes in, you just start at the top of the tree, work your way down till you hit a leaf, then you know you're done and you repeat. Now, depending on how you build this tree, you might have different lengths of encoding any kind of information you want to transmit. For example, the word transmitted here is abracadabra, which takes 30 bits with this particular tree. But there's another tree, this one over here, where it only takes 29 bits to get this across. So you can imagine that the name of the game becomes, can we find trees such that the corresponding codes are giving us short messages to encode whatever we want to get across? There's an answer to that. There's actually an optimal prefix-free code system called Huffman Codes. How does it work? How do you build that? Here's the algorithm, and it actually fits in just a couple of lines on one slide. You consider the probability pi of each symbol i in the input. Then you sort your symbols according to probability, and you find, um, hold on. You, you first generate a node for each one of them. Once you have all those nodes, you sort them according to probability. And you look at the two with lowest probability, bring them together, make that a little two node tree, and then repeat. So every time you look for the two lowest probability trees you have left, merge them and repeat. Once you do that, you get a Huffman code and right now that it's optimal, but later in lecture we'll see a proof of why this is the optimal encoding in this situation. Take a look at an example. Here we have some characters, some frequencies of the characters, which we can think of as probabilities, but just not normalized yet, and we want to find the Huffman tree. What you would do is you would say, well, which are the lowest probability ones? There is three of them, so there's a bit of, bit of a tie. The low probability ones are exclamation mark, D, and C. So the first thing you do is you pick two of them, and you merge them. This now becomes two. This is still one. The R here is still two. B is still two, and A is still five. And then what's lowest now? It's one with any one of the twos. It happened to pick this two, merges this one with this one, and this becomes three. Now what's lowest in terms of what's left? Because this one's gone, this one's gone. Um, these two are the two lowest ones. You merge them and get a four over here. What's lowest now? The three and the four. Merge them together, you get a seven. Then five and seven end up with 12 here, and you build your entire tree. And what it does, it makes the code words longer for things that are less likely to occur and shorter for things that are more likely. So this actually is under many of the systems that you've used many times in the past where people apply some ideas and then at the end apply a Huffman code to turn whatever symbols they came up with for representing their data into a more compact encoding of that. Okay, any questions on what we covered so far? So a natural question you might have is, um, well, what are the limits of compression? We've now built up an understanding that the reason we can compress is because there are probability distributions over symbols and we'll exploit by um, assigning shorter strings to high likely things. Um, but what's the limit of what we can achieve in this process? Many of you might have heard of this thing called um, entropy which Shannon kind of put forward back in the 1940s when the theory of communication was being invented. And this is the equation for entropy. What is this? It's saying that there's a distribution over symbols. There's a random variable x that represents like the randomness of the next symbol you might want to send. Um, specific symbols are, in we call them xi here. So i indexes over the different symbols we might want to send. And the Shannon entropy is this weighted sum by the probability of each symbol of 
log of 1 over the probability of the symbol. So this thing here is high if xi unlikely. And so you can think of log of 1 over pxi as a kind of quantitative measure of how much surprise you would have if this was a symbol being sent to you. And accordingly, in some sense, how much information you're getting by that symbol being sent, because that was very unlikely, all of a sudden you're like, oh wow, that's a lot of information I'm getting, this is actually the outcome. And then this would be some kind of weighted sum of these measures of surprise slash information that comes in each symbol that you might receive. Now, you probably have seen this equation before, um, and I'm just putting it here as is, but we're going to work in the next few slides through why this is actually the proper way of measuring information and how we can tie this to actual codes. A little bit of intuition. Here is one probability distribution over five possible symbols, and we can compute the entropy, do a little bit of math, and happens to be 2.25. Here's a different distribution, much more peaked. When distributions are more concentrated like this, there is a lot less um, uncertainty. You're pretty much guaranteed to get this symbol over here. So the way the math tends to work out in the entropy, when looking at it at first, you might wonder with this way that somehow this is going to play out, because the thing that's very concentrated and little information, will that dominate or not? The way it works out is that if things are concentrated like that, this weighted sum will be smaller. So on average, there is less information to be sent um, when you have this kind of peak distribution. Okay, let's now start thinking about some machinery to tie this general intuition of log one over P of X is a measure of information or surprise into actual codes. We'll need two inequalities to um, study this. So part one of the Kraft-McMillan inequality says that for any uniquely decodable code C, so we know that, for example, prefix-free codes, like corresponding with binary trees, are uniquely decodable. So that would be the typical example we might have in mind here. But for any uniquely decodable code C, we have that this inequality holds true. It's summing over all symbols and corresponding words in the code and then saying 2 to the negative length of that word and then all summed together should be smaller than or equal to 1. So what this is saying in some sense is that if my code is uniquely decodable, this is a consequence. And what this consequence is saying is something about that for this to be smaller than 1, this is a negative exponent. This means these lengths should be large for this to be satisfied. The larger the lengths, the easier it is to satisfy this inequality. So this is saying, if I have uniquely decodable code, it turns out my lengths have to be large enough to satisfy this inequality. Then, also an inequality, uh, a statement the other way around. If you have a set of lengths that are large enough to satisfy this inequality, then there exists a prefix code of the same size that has those lengths. So it goes both ways. If the length satisfy this, you have a code. If there is a code, then the lengths will have to satisfy this automatically. Simplest way to understand this, it might look like magic, it's actually very, very simple. Let's look at the first part. And let's look at it in the context of prefix codes. It's a little trickier in terms of non-prefix codes, but if we have a prefix code, then it is the case that this inequality is satisfied. Imagine you have a prefix code, that means there is some kind of binary tree corresponding to your code. Let's look at some sequencing of lengths of our code words and assume that L1 is corresponding to the code word with the shortest length. So if there's a prefix-free code, then there will be a tree where these code words are leaves in the tree and they're all in different leaves. We can then expand this tree into a full tree of length Ln, which is the depth of the deepest leaf. But we have a fully balanced tree now, depth of the deepest leaf in the original set of symbols. Each code word i will cover this many leaves of this expanded tree. If you had depth Li, there is Ln minus Li to go, and it exponentially grows, so you get 2 to the Ln minus Li left below you. 
Since there's no overlap in the leaves they cover, because that's the way a prefix-free tree works, it's all separated out, we have that the sum of all of those should be smaller than the sum of all, uh, the total number of leaves that we have in this big tree, which is 2 to the ln. Then we divide by 2 to the ln on both sides, and we get this inequality here. So, easy proof that once this inequality holds true, there is a prefix-free code tree corresponding to it. How about the other way around? Actually, let me pause. Any questions on this? Yes? So, uh, previously you said it's a uniquely uh, decodable C, but this is a prefix called C. Is it equivalent? Or? So, the theorem is true for any uniquely decodable mm -hmm. code. The proof is a lot simpler when looking at prefix-free codes. So for purposes of kind of getting through things at good pace and not getting bogged down in a lot of detailed math, I'm presenting the proof for this scenario, but the statement also holds true for any uniquely decodable code. Thank you. Other way around, let's say we have a set of word lengths that satisfy this inequality, namely they are reasonably large so that the sum of two to the negative the length is smaller than one. Then there is a prefix code corresponding to it. How do we get there? We again will sort all the lengths. We'll consider the full tree of depth LN, the longest word that we have. And then for each I, we pick any node of depth LI still available. We pick that node, we then cover anything below it, because you're absorbing that by picking a code word to live in that part of the tree. And we keep repeating this. How many leaves will we have covered? This many. We have from this assumption over here, that, which is corresponding to this here, that indeed this inequality will then be true. The sum of all of those will be smaller than the number of leaves in the tree, which means that Indeed, we've been able to put all these words inside our tree. So we've gone both ways now. Now that we have that, we can get to Shannon's theorem that says that the entropy of a distribution is smaller than or equal to the average code length for any uniquely decodable code that you can come up with. And then hopefully in the future we can push very close to the entropy and know that we're close to optimal. How do we prove this? Let's step through this one row at a time. This is the entropy, this is the right hand side, and we're gonna subtract them from each other, so we want this thing ultimately to be smaller than zero to prove this thing over here. This is missing minus Li over here. So that's just expanding the definition of entropy and the definition of LA, which is the average length of a code word when we use this code. This is just the definitions. This is definitions typeset. Then next line here is just saying LI is log of two to the LI. It's just something happening here. Then log, the, well, log of x minus log of y is log of x times y is applied uh, over y is applied over here. Once we have this, we apply something called Jensen's inequality, which is kind of pretty much always a thing you apply when you prove inequalities. What is Jensen's inequality? You say, oh, I have a log. The log function looks like this. I have an expected value of a log, so expected value of log of x. Maybe x could take this value, x1, or value x2, each with some probability. Then the log values are up there. I should draw a slightly more curved log. Let me redraw this log like this, and make the line between the two points this. Then Jensen's inequality says expected value of log of x which would be this thing over here, because this is one for log of x is not a log of x, so we're averaging them to get the expected value of log of x. 
lies below the log of the expected value of x, where you first average the x's to end up over here, and then compute the log, which lands you above. So that inequality is applied over here to bring the sum over pxi inside the log, because this expectation is a sum over probabilities. So another way to write this is sum over x px log of x is one or equal to log sum over x p of x times x. So that's what we did. The p of x is canceled out. Um, this thing here is corresponding to a uniquely decodable code, which means this thing is smaller than or equal to 1. Since the argument of the log is smaller than or equal to 1, the log of it is going to be smaller than 0, and we have our inequality. So this is a pretty big result, because it shows that entropy is a lower bound on how long our average code length will be if we have a uniquely decodable code set up. Can we get close to that? The converse here, we're going to show that the optimal prefix code is within 1 of h of x. So you'll pay only one extra bit per symbol that you send with the optimal prefix code, which might sound pretty good. Well, how might we go about this? Well, if we think log of 1 over p of x is a good way of measuring how important something is, and maybe we should then have as many bits as log of 1 over p of x, but that might not be a natural number. It might be a real number, fractional. So then we are going to round this up. That's what these little brackets mean here. It's rounded up from whatever this is to the nearest uh, integer. And every symbol will be assigned a code worth of length rounded up log 1 over p of xi. OK, we do that. Let's see how good this code is. Um, first, let's even see if we can build the code this way. Well, let's look at the code lengths. Let's fill them in over here. Then this is an inequality because we're replacing the rounding up by the thing itself, but it's in a negative exponent, so that's what, that will make it bigger. Then 2 to the log, that cancels each other out. We're left with pxi, we're left with 1 here. So we have shown that 2 to the negative code word lengths of this thing is not equal to 1 which we know from previous slide means that there exists a uniquely decodable code with these code word lengths. So we can build codes with these lengths. How good is this code? Um, well, that's just computing expectation. The average length is the weighted sum of the lengths. These lengths will be this thing over here, which is smaller than or equal to 1 plus the original thing. Let's bring out the 1, and the remainder thing comes out to be the entropy. So we've just shown that there exists a code where each symbol has this code length. And that code has an uh, expected encoding length, if you send a lot of symbols, of just one higher than the entropy. So that's pretty good. Earlier I said Huffman codes are the optimal prefix free codes. So um, what that means is that Huffman codes will land somewhere between h of x um, and h of x plus 1, because we know there exists one that is h of x lower than h of x plus 1. What's well, the proof for the Huffman codes being optimal? Actually, very simple, too. We can do this by induction a number of symbols n. So we'll look at the two lowest probability symbols, x and y, which is part of the process in building a Huffman code. Remember, we'd always pick the two lowest probability things left, combine them together, and build up our tree that way. Optimal prefix codes will always have two leaves in every lowest level branch. Imagine you have your tree. And imagine that you have a here, b here, and c here, and no d. Then it's really stupid to have done this last split, you should definitely just have stopped there and put C over here. All right? And so that's just what this is saying, that you would have stopped earlier if you're not going to have another split. So at the bottom, there will always be 
two next to each other. Um, if not, you could do one less split. So, without, without loss of generality, we can have X and Y, which are the lowest probability symbols, have the same parent in this tree. Let's call these guys X and Y. Every optimal, well, there exists an optimal prefix tree that has X and Y together with the same parent. Because if X and Y are at the bottom, they're going to be at the bottom because they're least probable, so they're going to end up at the bottom. And then you can shuffle the bottom code, code words around to get them to be together. Okay, then no matter the tree structure, once you go from stopping above X and Y and calling that done when you encode symbols, and doing that extra step, you're going to pay an additional cost of one bit every time you have to do that. And how often you have to do that? Px plus Py. That's the number of times you have to go that extra step compared to a tree that was one split less. So what that means is, OK, let me go back here. The point I didn't make yet is that this is actually unavoidable. Like any tree that has the X and Y split at the bottom, you will have to pay that additional cost, PX plus PY, to encode those two words whenever you encounter them, compared to a tree that was one less, that didn't have to do that extra step down. So since the tree with one less split is a tree over N minus one symbols, and we assume by induction that Huffman trees are optimal for N minus one symbols, we know that that tree is optimal. We just added on to it a split that is paying the minimum cost you're going to have to pay no matter what you do to add those two symbols. Um, we know that also for n, we're optimal. And then the induction hypothesis, the other side is that if you only have uh, one symbol, then the Huffman process is also optimal. OK, so quick recap. What did we cover? Entropy is this concept that says essentially the amount of information in a symbol is log 1 over p of xi. The average length then, or the average amount of information you would send when sending a random variable across um, is this thing over here, entropy, weighted sum of log 1 over probabilities. Shannon theorem says that if your data source is an order 0 Markov model, then any compression scheme must use at least entropy of the distribution number of bits per symbol on average. And then Huffman shows that there is a code that uses at most h of x plus 1 symbols to encode symbols from your, coming from your distribution. So pretty positive result. And this is actually a constructive result. It's not some kind of asymptotic you know, law, law of large number kind of thing that you often see in information theory to get results. It's actually fully constructive showing entropy is a lower bound, and you can get very close to it. Question? Is this Shannon's inequality tied for non-prefix-free For, so for uniquely decodable codes, yes. For non-uniquely decodable codes, I'm, I'm not sure how to deal with those. But so in some sense, there is not uniquely decodable. Not sure what to do with that, because then maybe it's not lossless, because you don't know what to do on the other side. Uniquely decodable, this is true. And whenever uniquely decodable, a subset of those are the prefix-free codes, and they also satisfy this. And those are the easier ones to work with. Yes? Um, why are you going to the around the app or log to y over p? Just to report? Can you ask the question again? Uh, why? Equal to the round up of log 2. Oh, OK. So you're asking, I think, about this slide over here and this particular part. So what we wanted to kind of think about on this slide is some sense, OK, there is this intuition that log of 1 over pxi corresponds to kind of how much information comes with that particular thing, because it's very surprising. So then you might say, well, or ask the question, would it work 
for if we have a distribution to assign code lines to each symbol corresponding to this because our intuition is that this corresponds to information content and then what this showed here is that if you assign symbols if you want to assign symbols of that length actually it's possible because when you use those lengths for symbols this inequality is satisfied which means that there exists a uniquely decodable code with those symbol lengths any other questions Let's see. okay so we're in pretty good shape now we have some constructive positive results might ask a question, which also Shannon asked himself, what is the entropy of the English language? So Shannon ran an experiment, I guess kind of mechanical Turk experiment before mechanical Turk existed, and essentially would ask people, given a sequence of characters already shown to them, can you predict the next character in this English sentence? And ask them to predict, and it turns out that 79% of the time, in their first guess, people could predict what the next character was going to be. Then 8% of the time, they needed a second guess to get it right. 3% um, of the time, they needed a third guess, and so forth. And based on that, Shannon estimated that English language has an entropy of about one bit per character, that the new amount of information is just one bit um, by computing the entropy of this distribution over here. So I don't think we're there yet. In, practical compression schemes, um, because humans might still be better at predicting the next character at times, but hopefully we'll get there soon. So, we've seen the theoretical limits, we've seen constructively how to get to them, um, but now let's think about some of the factors at play here. What we've done is we have essentially said, if we have a distribution over symbols, we can build a near-optimal code. But what if our distribution over symbols that we think we have is not the correct distribution? What will happen? How poorly might we do? And can we get better distributions? If our distribution is better, can we do better? Let's say maybe build a higher order model, like Shannon was looking at, predict the next character, not just individual characters independently. And then the plus one, um, it might sound not too bad, but actually we'll see soon that the plus one can be pretty costly, and we'll want to get around that and not pay that plus one penalty for every symbol we send. So, what if you use p hat to approximate p? Okay, expected code length when using p hat to construct a code. Let's see, average code length word is with some overall possible words we want, might want to send, and weight the length of what we send, which will be log of one over p hat i, because we use our estimated distribution to design our code. So code word length will be log one over p hat of i and then weighted by the actual distribution, pi, which is what is in the data that we will encounter. Okay, let's add and subtract, or subtract and add the same quantity. Then let's regroup some of these things, so we'll bring the first two together, and this just stays, the other two get paired together. This last thing here is actually the entropy. So what we see is that the expected code length is the entropy plus this thing that we'll call the KL between P and P hat, which is this quantity over here. If you have not seen this before, KL divergence is a kind of way of measuring how far apart two probability distributions are. And a lot of the reasons behind it, people like to use it, comes down to what we're seeing here right now, is that if you use P hat to construct a code, but really you should have used P, KL between P and P hat is the price you pay. You might wonder, can the price ever be negative? Can I actually have benefited by using the wrong distribution for encoding? Turns out that's never the case. So the KL divergence is always positive. The simple proof on the slide, not gonna step through it, is just a little bit of math manipulation. Again, that same little trick of expectation of log versus log of expectation that will tell you that KL is always positive. So you always pay a price and so the distance, the KL distance or divergence between two distributions is always a positive number and is zero when they're identical distributions and only when they're identical distributions. So whenever you have a wrong distribution used for coding, you pay the price and this is the price. 
and it's called KL divergence. After, maybe I should spell it out. Some people behind it, behind it Koblak, Liebler, divergence, those are people who came up with this uh, notion of distance between probability distributions. Okay, so what that ties back into essentially what Jonathan was talking about earlier. If you start thinking about, I want to compress images, I want to train an autoregressive model, I'm going to train that model on a bunch of data, I might want to use that model later to decide how to generate code words that I'll use on future data. The better that model is that I train, the better my p hat will be an approximation of p, and so the better the resulting code will be to encode my future data. So, now, what if you were to train really, really well and still your p of x is high entropy? Then we know that no matter what code we use, even the best code will be one that has high average code worth length. Well, a solution around this might be to essentially not just look at p of x, but look at p of x conditioned on some context. So, assume you already have some context. Maybe it's things you send over the line in the past. Maybe previous pixels you send across. Then maybe you can predict the next pixel more precisely than if you did independent prediction for each of the pixels. And so, the price you would pay then on expectation would be the conditional entropy. How much entropy there is in the conditional given the context you already sent. This is the conditional entropy equation, which is just saying averaging over all contexts, and then look at entropy of x given c. Conditional entropy is always smaller than original entropy, because you might wonder, what if I do all this work, and then maybe h of x would have been better? Not going to be the case. Again, the same thing, this kind of expectation of log, log of expectation, allows you to get an inequality that shows that the entropy Condition on some context is always smaller than the entropy when you don't get the condition. This shouldn't be too surprising, because when you get the condition, you get to make a prediction of the next thing based on what you've seen so far, and if you make the best possible prediction, at the very least you should do it as well as just ignoring the context and making the best possible prediction when ignoring the context. Okay, autoregressive models do exactly that. They try to encode things one at a time always using everything that's already been there in the past to predict the next thing. And so, in some sense, they are maximally suitable for getting low entropy and being able to compress things well. How about the plus one? Well, remember we had this theorem that says Huffman, Huffman coding will use at most h of x plus one. And plus one doesn't sound much because you have to send bits across and one more doesn't seem much more than, I mean, what else could you hope for? Well, let's look at an example of how bad this actually could be. If we have good, very good predictive models which make the entropy very, very low, then actually you might pay a very high price with a plus one. For example, Assuming your distribution is such that, maybe conditional, that you have very high probability on one of the symbols, 90%, and low probability on the two others that might have to be sent across. Then the entropy is 0.569. The best code you can do for this is have a single bit for the high probability thing, and then two bits for each of the other things. The expected code length here is 1.1. Um, Indeed, our code is less expensive than entropy plus one. That would have been 1.56, which is even higher. But actually, the 1.1 is still about 2x what you would have with just entropy level encoding. So if we use this encoding, we have to send twice as many bits compared to Shannon's entropy limit. So that's not great. That's a high price to pay. Can we get around this? Any thoughts? Uh, you can double up, like transmit two messages at the same time. So if you like have pairs of things, then you incur a penalty of one on every two, or like you send more and more. Mm -hmm. That one goes away relative to you. Yeah. So the suggestions, just make sure everybody can hear it, is um, the plus one is paid for every symbol you send. But if you 
try to send two symbols in one go, you'll pay that plus one only once for both symbols combined. And maybe you don't just send two in one go, you send three or four or five, you encode them together, and now all of a sudden the plus one gets paid maybe once every 10 times, every 100 times, right, on every time you had a symbol in your source. That's exactly what people have been doing, and in different ways. One way to do it, this is how fax, so who here has ever used a fax machine? A couple of people, five, six people. I had to use a fax machine a couple of weeks ago. It was really hard. Um, it's, it's so much more difficult than the way we communicate today. Um, but actually, it used to be a pretty advanced way of communicating 30 years ago. And the way it worked is that you have a sheet of paper and you feed it essentially into a scanner. And the scanner will turn it into a pixel image where every pixel is either white or black. And if you encode one pixel at a time, you'll pay a high overhead. Um, and in fact, you, you can't even do anything one pixel at a time. You either have to send, send zero or one, and you can't compress at all. So you want to send multiple symbols in one go. Given there's often long stretches of white and black, what people came up with is this notion that instead of sending is next one white or black, you say how many whites or how many blacks are next, you encode the number. You say, okay, it might be 10 blacks next, or 12 blacks next, or 10 whites next. And then you build your Huffman code on essentially symbols that correspond to run lengths of white or black. And that's what you send across. Now, there might be 100 the same, say 100 whites coming across. Now you only have to send one uh, code word, and you pay the price of plus one only once. So with English language, if you do the statistics, you could look at the entropy of well, you could look at ASCII coding, which use, uses seven bits per character. You could you'll look at the entropy of a single character at a time, which is 4.5. Then Huffman coding on top of that has 4.7, so you pay a price of 0.2 compared to the entropy. Then if you group the characters in English language in groups of eight, and then uh, compute the entropy, you get 2.4, which is lower, and Asymptotically, as you get bigger groups and do a conditional prediction, people have gotten to 1.3 and probably below that by now. And Shannon, of course, thinks it should be 1 if you do a really good prediction. So we see that this grouping actually makes a very big difference compared to just sending uh, one character at a time. Okay, so we've looked at what coding is, what the limits are, what some considerations are to make it better. The tricky part with grouping is that it still is not always that convenient to group things together. Yes, question. Yes, that grouping has approaches 1.3, how do you do better than that? Um, so I forgot how this 1.3 was attained, um, so I can't answer that question right now. I think this is making longer groups, but it could also be conditional prediction of the best type that they had when they wrote this up, which is a couple of years ago. This, was, this, this compression write-up is very nice summary, but it's from 2013. It's before we had models like char RNN and so forth that make prediction of next character better than what we had five years ago, which would make this number lower. My hunch is that this is conditional prediction based on a simpler model they had then than the more advanced models we have today, so in a worse P. Um, resulting in the 1.3, and that current models are going to start getting closer to 1 if Shannon is right. Other questions? Let's see. Okay, so we saw some solution to the plus 1, and it's one that's used in faxing and in some other places, but it's not the most convenient solution if you have to always group things together. And then still, every time, you have to pay the price of one whenever you decide this is the end of your group of what you're sending across. We'll see a, now a very cool coding scheme called arithmetic coding that allows you to not have to pay that price of one until the very end of your entire stream of what you're going to send across. You paid only once. Um, technically, you might play a, pay a plus two, but you pay the price only once for the entire stream you're going to send across. So, key motivation here is that we want some kind of flexible system to encode multiple symbols in one go to avoid that plus one overhead we might pay after every symbol. Key idea behind arithmetic coding is that we're going to do it by indexing into a distribution. 
It's very compatible with auto aggressive models. And in fact, I think it's one of the cool things you could try for your um, homework one for the bonus section is to see after you train your auto aggressive models, how well do you do when you combine it with arithmetic coding in terms of compressing uh, data sets. Okay. Um, let's say we have a distribution over two symbols, A and B, and one is probability 80%, the other one 20%. Entropy will be much lower than one bit, but if you need to encode one symbol at a time naively, you always have to send one bit. Let's encode AABA. Okay, we have this distribution, and what we're going to say is that there's 0.8 chance we land in the first half, 20% chance we land in the second half. The first thing is an A, so actually we're going to say that we landed somewhere over here. Then we'll look at the next symbol. It's A again. That puts us effectively over here. The next one is B. We'll have to split that interval, and now we are over here. Next one is A. We'll split that up again, and now we are over here. And so in some sense, that interval from 0.512 to 0.64 if the other side knows that the distribution we're using is 0 0.8, 0 0.2, then if we send that interval across, they will be able to decode that into knowing that we had A, A, B, A on our side. Now the question, of course, is how do we send intervals across? But that, this is the overall scheme. Any questions about this? Uh, from here, it's just a bunch of details we need to fill in, but the key idea is that you can keep repeating this no matter how long your bit stream, you can keep going narrow and narrow and narrow with your interval, and that narrower and narrower interval will encode a longer and longer bit stream. And then, of course, we need to still encode that interval, and we'll pay a small price there. We only have to do it once. Do they already need to know how many symbols? OK, so that's a good question. In a scheme like this, the assumption is that both sides have shared some information ahead of time. So ahead of time, you both know that the distribution you're using is this distribution over here. If the receiving side doesn't know that, then it cannot start decoding. So the receiving side does not only know what you're asking about which are the symbols, but also the probabilities that were associated at encoding time with each of the symbols. And so if we start looking at autoregressive models, same thing will be true there. You have probabilities coming from an autoregressive model. You need that model to also live on the other side, which in case of a gigantic neural network might be a pretty big model. You also have to get over to the other side. Um, and sometimes you want to also account for that, of course. I need to send over my neural network model, and I need to then send over a stream that encodes this interval. So how do we encode an interval? Well, naive attempt. Um, represent each interval by just selecting a number within the interval, which has the fewest bits in binary fractional notation, and use that as a code. So let's say we add intervals like 0 to 0.33, 0 0.33 to 0.67, and then 0.67 to 1. We can represent these with 0 0.01 in binary, which is 1 fourth, 0 0.1 in binary, which is 1 half, and 0 0.11, which is 3 quarters. And it's not very hard to show that for an interval of size s, we need at most um, rounded up log 2s bits to represent uh, such, well, there's a negative here. So S will be an interval, will be a number smaller than one. Log will be a negative number. We'll have to flip that sign. And this has to be in here instead of on the outside. So we flip the sign first, then have to round up. So that's good, that's good news, because that means that if we send a, you know, something along, this S here, the size of the interval, that's actually the probability of that bit stream. And so we see a direct connection between log one over probability because of the negative sign here, log one over probability of the bit stream, the entire bit stream, and how many bits we have to send, which is hitting our asymptotic limits, so that's great. Constructively, this is not great because actually this does not result in a prefix-free code. We already saw this here, the point 0.1 and the point 0.11. Um, if you send 1.1, you don't know. Did you send, you know, one and then again one, or is it, you don't, you don't know where you're at in this thing. So instead, what people, 
do is have each binary number correspond to an interval of all possible completions. So when we have a binary number, say, no matter what I put behind the digits I've sent so far, where could it be? That's an interval. So rather than thinking of this is a number that falls in interval, it represents an entire interval. And then you need to keep going till that interval that you represent is a subset of the interval that you want to send. Turns out that also there you can show that you can always find um, binary sequences of length at most, well, let me rewrite this log 2 of 1 over s, because as is the probability we're dealing with here, 1 over s is the quantity we want. So at this large. So how does that compare to entropy? In some sense, that's a plus 2, because there's a rounding up here that might have to happen, and there is the, the plus 1 here um, also. But that means that we pay a plus 2 overhead for the entire stream at most, rather than a plus 1 on every symbol. Any remaining challenges? Um, well, an interval could be straddling the 0 0.5 thing. So what that means, is, let's say you get this stream of symbols coming in, and you're working on your interval, and the thing that you want to send is right sitting around 0 0.5. And now you're waiting, 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 because you don't know whether the first thing you're going to send is a 0 or a 1. You're essentially just stuck waiting, maybe till the end of your stream, till you finally know, oh, the first thing I should send is a 0 or a 1. And that might incur a lot of latency. So the solution people typically use around that is to still split your messages into blocks. So you wouldn't send the entire thing in one go. You would still have blocks such that this kind of bad corner case scenario can't happen to you. It also assumes infinite precision, which is kind of a strong assumption because you're not really sending um, real numbers across in what we just described. Um, that's being assumed. So it turns out there are integer implementations of this. I'll refer you to the Blalog uh, paper to read about the details, but essentially what you do is you find a integer number that allows you to make your probabilities frequencies that are integers rather than fractional numbers, and then you work with that. How does this combine with what Jonathan was talking about? Well, very simple actually. You don't need to use the exact same distribution in every step. We can use different p every time. So first symbol, we use p of x1. Second symbol, we use p of x2 given x1 coming from our autoregressive model. Third symbol, we use p of x3 given x2 and x1 coming from our autoregressive model, and so forth. And if our autoregressive model is really good, then it'll be very predictive of what comes next, and we'll have an entropy of this model that's very low, and we'll approach this entropy up to an extra plus 2, so we'll have a very efficient encoding of our image to send to the other side. Again, with the caveat, of course, the question came up earlier, the caveat here is if you have a massive neural network for these things, that massive neural network also needs to be on the receiving side or you cannot do this decoding. Sorry, is there any yeah. lower bound on H of X given C? Any lower bound, so H of X given C, and you want a lower bound, like how, essentially, how good can this become? Um, so essentially, how good can your autoregressive model be? Um, so, in some sense, maybe there is, um, in that, let's see, let's say you have some data, x1, x2, x3, and so forth, a bunch of data. And let's say it's discrete and lives in some high dimensional space. We'll do it with continuous stuff later, but let's say it's all discrete. Um, then let's say you train your model. You'd be trying to maximize the overall choice of theta, the log, or the sum over i log p theta xi, right? Um, and so this thing here, I mean, it's related to your question. It's not exactly conditional, but you can imagine doing the same thing for a conditional. Um, when you train this model, you could ask the question, how good can this possibly be? Am I close? Um, and so you could ask, well, if all I care about is training data, then I can train it all the way on the training data and see where I get. And 
what's the closest you can get on your training data? Essentially, if every data example is different, then the closest you could get, and if you think of it as um, essentially completely different things, then it would be using the counts, the histogram approach that Jonathan presented last lecture. That histogram approach will have the highest log likelihood you can possibly achieve on that data set, but it will of course overfit and will be terrible on new data, but you can then compare the score you're getting here with what the histogram-based score would have been, which essentially is a uniform distribution over all your data points if they're all different, and compare that with this. Um, once you have models that are conditional, where one thing is you do partial predictions, it becomes a lot more complicated to figure out what a reasonable lower bound one might be, and I don't know how to come up with one for that. But if it's completely categorical, then you could have the histogram as the lower bound uh, for your parametric distribution. Yes? Will the receiver be able to uniquely decode, the, like uniquely get the code out of the interval? Sorry, say it again? Can the receiver uniquely determine the number, like the A, B, A from the interval only? So the question is, how does the decoder decode? And this kind of goes back to this here, and I realize I went a little fast, but essentially the idea here is that if you send 0 0.00, zero, oops, if you send 0 0.00, then it encodes the entire interval 0 to 0 0.25. And so if you're not happy with having sent across entire 0, 0 point, let's go back to the example, so where we had it on numerically, 0.512 to 0.64, we will have to find a binary number, a fractional binary number, this would be 0 0.1001 something probably, um, where if you have that binary number and you either end it there or you end it with all ones behind it forever, that that, in, that interval lies within this 0.512 to 0.614 interval. If it lies within that, then you're good to go. Um, if not, then you need to keep attaching uh, bits till you have something where that number, either in itself or then on the other side with all ones extended, together forms an interval that falls within the interval you're trying to send. But my question is, is the A, B, A unique from this interval? Say it again? Is the A, B, A like... Oh, is you're asking, is A, A, B, A the only thing that could land here? Correct. Because the way we constructed this is that when you start with A, you're only left with the first 0 0.8, and this is discarded. So this already says you have started with A. Then we, we took this interval and subsplit it in a way where only we're left with the thing that responds to the next A, and repeated this process. So we're always narrowing it down to correspond with every symbol we processed so far, mm -hmm. and when we're left with an interval, it corresponds to having that specific sequence of symbols that we processed. Any other questions? Sorry, say it again? Uh, you, reference, you reference the interval with the number inside the interval, right? So, so we will, no, we will, the question is how do we represent the interval? Let's say we want to represent this interval over here. Yeah. We will need to find a binary number that falls within this interval. Yeah. And that is such that, let's say this number falls over here. That is such that if I take that number and extend it with all ones behind it, making it larger, that that resulting number also still falls in the interval. And then I'm okay to send it across. If that's not the case, if I extend it with all ones and it falls still here, then I, I need more di significant digits in what I send across. Does yes? Does the receiver know about all these intervals? Say it again? Does the receiver know about the, all the possible intervals? Yes, the receiver will essentially have to follow the same scheme on their side to figure out, and they will need to know the probabilities to be able to know where each of the intervals are. So that's what I meant, we have to send the whole neural network across, because without having that neural network, the receiver will not know these conditional probabilities and will not know how to decode. Now the hope might be that you send many, many images across, and you send neural network only once, and then it can be reused for millions and millions of images that they receive on their side. Maybe the network is in your phone. It's hard-coded in a chip in your phone, and it's ready to decode against a scheme that's been predetermined, and so when somebody sends something, they use 
that same scheme and you don't have to send the network across. Yes? Um, is the interval solution still prefix-free? Is the interval solution still prefix-free? Yes, it is. Um, so, well, let's put it this way. The assumption is that you clearly stop at some point. So you send, 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 and at some point it's clear that you're done sending. So there is a notion of being done sending, but as you receive that stream, um, there is no ambiguities about, so I guess it's not, prefix three maybe not the right way to, to phrase it. It's uniquely decodable, but you're only sending one thing in this setup, and you know when you're done sending it. Anything wrong with the naive attempt? Um, it's a good question. Um, let me think about that offline, because I, I know Jonathan has a full hour, and more or less, and I want to make sure to wrap this up in the next minute. OK, so we've looked at different ways of doing compression, uh, all relying on statistical properties of the data, um, static models. Um, might be okay. Um, dynamic models could be better if you essentially fit your model as new data comes in. You might be able to fit your model or new data sets come in, you refit a model. That might do better because we know the better the distribution, the better you're going to do. You could take this in some sense to the extreme and keep fitting your model as data comes in rather than having a fixed model that you use, that you train ahead of time and then use for the entire data thing. I want to give you one example of something along those lines, which is something you're, I think, quite familiar with, which is lempel ziff uh, encoding. The details don't really matter too much, but I think the high-level idea is pretty interesting and ties back into things you can apply in learning methods also. High-level idea is that when you try to send a file across, you don't build a codebook ahead of time. You just send the first piece, and then for the next piece, you see did I already have something before that looked a lot like it? And if so, I just send a pointer to where that occurred and repeat. And so sometimes you're training a model on the fly that's a pointer-based model to referencing things that you've seen before. How does that work? Here's an example. I want to send this string across. Step one, I'm here, I'm at A. I have nothing before me, so I'll say, well, look at position zero before me, it doesn't really matter. I have zero matches before me. And the thing, in addition to the matches before me that I'm going to send, is A. Then we're on to the next line. We're here now. It says, hey, I'm going to look at what I've seen in the past. In position 1 before me, I saw what I'm seeing now, A. Um, it's a length of 1 that I should take from there, because this is all I have here, it turns out. And then after that, I'm going to attach a C. So we've encoded all of this by sending this across. Then we're here. Line three, we're at A, but again, we want to encode as much as we possibly can. It's A, A, C, and the underlines mean, I'll underline in green also, means that this is how far it's willing to look ahead. It sees A, A, C, A. How close a match to that can I find? It turns out I can find the length four match. Kind of weird with some overlap, but that's how it happens to work. So it says I found a length four match. Where did I find it? Three symbols back. I have to go three back. I'm right now over here. I have to go three back to find the start of that match. That's this three. Then the match is four long. And after I've done that match, generated that entire match, the next thing is a B, which is this thing over here. You might say it's a little funny that there's overlap, but it turns out that because the order in which you send things, it actually you can decode this just fine. Next one, line four. We're here now, looking at C. It's C followed by A, by B, by A. Can we find a match for C followed by A, by B, by A? Let's see. Well, actually, three positions back, starting here, we can find a match that's length 3. So three positions back, a match of length 3. And then after this match of length 3, what comes is an A, which is this A over here, and so forth. So it's a very different way of encoding things. It's non-parametric, doesn't have a probability distribution. Um, but it's a way to be extremely adaptive to the data that you're receiving. Um, you can imagine parametric adaptations of this where you learn a probability distribution on the fly or you meta-learn distributions and fine-tune them on the fly as your data comes in. Those are all ideas that you could consider playing with and see how well it works to do compression compared to existing schemes. 
If you'd like to challenge yourself, and I uh, encourage you to do so, there's actually a compression challenge uh, that is part of a workshop that is associated with CVPR, which is one of the main computer vision conferences. This is the website of the compression challenge. So they have a bunch of data that you can then train models on. They actually have an arithmetic encoder decoder for you. So the details of arithmetic encoding decoding, you don't have to worry about. The code is available for you. You just need to make sure you build a good model that generates good probabilities that then can get fed into it and see how good your encoding is. Then, of course, they also have holdout data, and you'll need to run your compressor, decompressor on holdout data to see how good it really is. Otherwise, you might overfit to the training data. And so that could be something pretty interesting to play with. Um, this morning, um, Louis from um, Amazon came by, and he leads the Amazon compression team. And he's very interested in this. And he said, in addition to the credits that we already have for the class from Amazon for um, the homework. If somebody is being very serious about this kind of compression challenge, um, he is happy to see at how seriously you're taking this and then give you more credits to see what you can do if you have more compute available on this kind of challenge. So if you feel like compute constrained and are trying to push this hard, let me know. I can put you in touch and he can give you more credits. He also has a separate data set that he's also curious about if people are doing well on this. Can you do well on that data set? And also has more compute credits if you want to push that hard. Cool. That's it for compression. I think it's time for, do we have food, Arvind? OK. Want to bring it in? Time for a pizza break. Yeah. OK, so this part of the lecture will be about, still be about likelihood-based models. We're still working with, like, with models where you can exactly evaluate log probability of x for some given x. Um, but instead of discrete models, we're going to be working with continuous models now. These are going to be density models. Um, and these are called flows. So these are going to be related to the autoregressive models that you saw, but they're going to be, work, they're going to be um, working with continuous data. So to just set the stage, um, what, what do we actually want at the end of the day? Well, if, if we assume that we want a likelihood-based model, what do we want out of the likelihood-based model? Well, we want it to be able to train quickly, and we also want it to be able to sample quickly. Um, this is the same thing as, uh, say, being, if, you're, if you're tied to compression, this is the same thing as being able to compress quickly and decompress quickly. They're, they're actually the same thing. Um, and not only do we want to do this quickly, we want it to work well. So we want the compression performance to be good. We want the samples to look good. And so far, we've been working with these discrete autoregressive models. Um, so these are great because they allow you to evaluate likelihood quickly. They compress very well. Um, and the samples are good as, as long as you're careful about what you're doing. The main drawback is the sampling speed. Um, as, as we just talked about in the previous part of the lecture. There's also a second uh, drawback, which is that it's, it's a discrete model. Oftentimes, the data that we work with in the real world is continuous, and it's kind of unnatural to try to fit it, fit it into a, it, it might be unnatural to fit a discrete model to it. So flows are going to be a framework for designing likelihood-based models, which are continuous density models. And just somehow, it seems like for, for some reason, this framework will let us design models that kind of interpolate and trade off, behind, trade off between all these different objectives, which is pretty cool. OK, so what we're going to talk about first is, what is a flow? OK, so to set the stage again with, with uh, density models, this is some continuous data. Continuous data just means that it's a bunch of real numbers. Uh, this is how data usually comes to you when you read it off of a physical sensor, like, I don't know, a thermometer or something like that. And the standard one modeling approach, if you're tied to using a discrete model, is to quantize the data, you know, tur turn, it into, turn it into these bins, the, these bin indices, and then fit your favorite discrete model, like a histogram or a discrete autoregressive model. And that could work fine. 
But we'd like to work with the continuous data directly. So models that fit continuous data and work with continuous data directly are called density models. They're called this because they represent probability density functions. So if you recall, uh, with discrete random variables, you have an associated probability mass function. With continuous random variables, you have an associated probability density function. The density function, what it does is it tells you the probability. It, if, you, if you take this density function and you integrate it over some interval, it tells you the probability that the data will land in that interval. Okay, that's the meaning of this. And so we would like to fit models that, instead of estimating probability mass, now we estimate probability density. So we have to somehow define models that are compatible with that um, and also are trainable. And that's going to be the challenge of designing density models. So in one dimension, there's a very famous, or many dimensions, but uh, there's a very famous uh, density model. It's called a mixture of Gaussians. I think many of you have seen this before. This is a very standard toolkit in our machine learning toolbox. So a mixture of Gaussians is exactly what it sounds like. It's a mixture of, yeah, well, a mixture is this convex combination uh, weighted by these, by these uh, I can use this. So, so these are coefficients that sum to one. Um, and these are individual Gaussians here. So here, th this is one component and this is another component. And if you, well, the, the parameters of this model are these pi's and also the individual means and standard deviations of the Gaussians. And this is a perfectly good model. You can fit this model using maximum likelihood. Uh, some of you may have seen the EM algorithm before. That is, that is maximum likelihood. So what you do is you find these parameters, mu, sigma, and pi, uh, so that the likelihood is as big as possible. Yeah, sure. Yeah, that's, that's totally fine. Uh, what algorithm you pick is totally up to you, and it's up to what works best for your application domain. But the point is, at the end of the day, it is maximum likelihood. OK, so as you can probably guess, this is not the final uh, model that we're going to be using. And why is that? It's that they, do, they really don't work with high dimensional data. OK, so here is. Um, an adorable picture of one of the instructor's uh, dogs. Um, so the, let, let's try to think about if this is the data distribution that we're trying to model, this distribution of images of dogs. Um, is a mixture of Gaussians ever going to be really successful for modeling this kind of distribution? Well, the answer is no. And the way to see this is to imagine what it means to sample from a mixture of Gaussians. So if I go back to the previous slide, what it means to sample from a mixture of Gaussians is to sample a cluster, a cluster ID, you know, what one of the Gaussians, and then sample from that Gaussian. Right? So if we imagine that set up for images, what that means is we're going to sample some mean, which has the same shape as an image. And then you, what you do is you sample a Gaussian around it. In other words, you add Gaussian noise to the image. This is what happens when you add Gaussian noise to images. Like it, it turns something like this into this. So in order for this sampling process to generate a realistic looking image, well, the cluster center had, already look, had better already look like an image. And the amount of Gaussian noise you add must be small. That, that's really the only way a realistic looking image will come out of a Gaussian mixture model. In other words, for a Gaussian mixture model to generate this image, it must already be stored in the parameters. Right, it just must already be a mean. So that's kind of a very, it's kind of a useless density model for uh, this kind of data. It, it's basically a histogram. Okay, so how can we deal with this? Um, so our goal now in, in this part of the lecture is to define density models that don't have this shortcoming. We're gonna have to somehow throw neural nets in there. So, okay, how, how do we throw a neural net into this whole picture? Um, the way we're going to do this is by shifting perspective a little bit. Instead of thinking about fitting density functions, in, in other words, instead of thinking about estimating the probability density of, of, the, of the random variable, which is the data, we instead think about fitting the cumulative distribution function. 
So normally there's actually no point in thinking of it this way, but the reason that we'll think about it this way is that it'll let us generalize into models that work with high dimensional data. So just bear with me for a moment. So this here is called the cumulative distribution function, or CDF, I'll just say CDF. And the CDF is at a point X, let's say here, it's this value, and that's given by integrating the PDF from negative infinity to that point. So the, the area under this curve in, in green um, is this value right here. So the CDF here must be zero, and the CDF at the very right must be one. And that's just because how probabilities work, yes? In the, in the previous example with the image, is, the, is every pixel value generate, like, generated by a single Gaussian, or are you generating like, portions, of the Im are portions of the image modeled as mixtures of Gaussians? Um, here I, well, to generate this visualization, I took this image and added Gaussian noise to it independently to, to, every, uh, uh, to every pixel. So that, that would be the setting uh, when these, uh, actually these Gaussians have a diagonal covariance matrix. I see. So you should be able to do better. Uh, if you're willing, oh yeah, definitely. If you're willing to have, say, a full covariance matrix. Um, but that's, the, the amount of space and computation that it takes is dimension squared. And remember, dimension is very large here. So squaring dimension is not a good idea. And we try to avoid it if possible. That's why if we force ourselves to stick with Gaussians, we tend to use diagonal uh, covariance matrices or, or uh, sparse ones. Our neural nets are going to have fewer parameters than n squared. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> they, they actually might have a lot of parameters. Um, but we, we hope that they'll scale better with the dimension. OK. So this is a CDF. I'm hoping everybody has seen this before. Um, so instead of fitting PDFs, we'll think about fitting CDFs. Now, why do we think about fitting a CDF? Well, we all know this fact. Um, this is going to be a very important fact, and we saw this in the first lecture with histograms, is that given a PDF, here's a, here's a PDF. Say you're given this, say from a mixture model or from some other kind of model. How do you sample from the, the distribution? Well, what you do is sample a uniform random variable between 0 and 1, and you pass it through the inverse CDF. Now, the fact, it's a fact that if you do so, the distribution of x, the distribution of this guy over here, will match what will be the, the distribution uh, represented by the model. So the way that works is, uh, what that means is you sample a uniform random number on the y-axis here, like say this point, and then you, well, you want to compute its inverse, so this point. And the statement is that if you sample uniformly on the y-axis, um, that'll lead to these points down here on the x-axis, which come from the inverse, will, will be samples from the model. OK, so I think we all know this. This is the same deal with histograms, and we saw this in the first lecture. But the point I want to emphasize is that the CDF of the model defines an invertible differentiable transformation from the data to the unit interval. In other words, what that means is that when we train the density model P, suppose we train this density model P, if we think about the CDF, that means what we've done is we've taken the data distribution and we've transformed it into a uniform distribution on the unit interval from 0 to 1. Since it's invertible, we can say something which is entirely equivalent. After training the density model, what we've done is we've found a way to transform a universe, uh, we've, we've found a way to transform the, the uniform distribution into the data distribution. So these transformations from here, here's, the, here's the uniform distribution between 0 and 1. And here, here's the data. So these types of invertible transformations between data and noise, or data and latent variable, uh, we call these things flows. This is what our community calls, calls these things. And the point of this lecture is that we're going to try to work with flows directly. Instead of worrying about approximating probability densities, we're going to worry about coming up with invertible flows 
defining neural networks, which are invertible transformations, which are differentiable. And we will think about fitting those directly. In other words, we'll be thinking about how to convert data into noise and, and vice versa. OK. So just by ad adopting this perspective, we can already get, yes? Is the support for XMZ the same for It depends on how the flow is set up. It doesn't necessarily have to be the same. Um, here, we'll see an example where they actually are the same. Um, so just by adopting this way of thinking in terms of flows instead of probability densities, uh, we can already get a slight generalization over what we just got. So before, if we wor were working with CDFs, this, this, uh, this noise must be in this interval 0 to 1. And it, we're always working with a uniform distribution. But actually, we can work with noise, which is, uh, really comes from any distribution. We just want the property that it's sort of easy to sample from, and it's easy to evaluate the, the probability for. Uh, but we can work with any distribution. And we can pose this problem, which is to learn a flow, which is, in, which is a mapping from data. Here's data. And we want to learn how to map it to noise so that the data distribution gets transformed into this simple, what we call a base distribution. So this is the terminology that I'll use here. Does this setup make sense? This, this is the goal of flows. And one important thing is that after we learn this flow, so after we've learned how to transform the data into this base distribution, if we do that successfully, that means we can generate new samples from the model. All we have to do is sample from the base distribution and pass it through the inverse of the flow. So we'll have to design flows that are invertible and are easy to invert. But if we can do that, then this is how we generate samples from the model. OK. So here's a real example. Actually, I actually coded this up, so th this is actually real. So here's an example of some data. So here's a data distribution. So P data. Um, and here, this middle plot, this is a flow. So this is a flow from in, in one dimension. So a flow, again, is an invertible transformation. And we know that invertible transformations in one dimension are monotonic functions, right? So this is a monotonic function. You can see that it just sort of goes up. And at initialization, I haven't specified how, how I parameterize this flow, but at initialization of this flow, it's pretty much an identity function, right? So you can see that it takes the, the data distribution, and on the right over here, these are uh, plots of samples uh, of what happens if you take a data point and you pass it through the flow to get a value z. So this is x, and this is z. So since the flow is an identity at the beginning of training, um, the distribution looks exactly the same after you pass it through the flow. This should make sense. What about after training? I haven't specified how to train this or what the model looks like. But after training, this is what happens. So here I've trained the flow to turn the data into a Gaussian distribution here. And how, how does that work? Well, the flow is no longer a straight line, so it's not an identity function. But it, there, there's some sort of bumps into, in it. Um, and what the bumps do, well, we, we can think about what, it, what a bump does. Um, so let's see. So we can look at this interval over here. This interval over here contains a lot of data. Right? This is very likely in the, under the data distribution. And we can see that the corresponding interval under the flow here to here, right, that has a very steep slope. And so what that means is that if it has a very steep slope, it gets assigned a very large area on the y-axis, which means that it's very likely under the base distribution. Right? So that way, when you invert it, it's very likely to, but when you invert it, you're very likely to land back over there. And you can see a similar little increase in, uh, in the derivative uh, for, the second, for the second part. And so this, ju this just turns out that, um, oops. 
So this flow is trained so that if you take this distribution, you really do, it really does turn the data into an, a standard normal. Yeah. Um, on the previous slide, you said that if you sample, if Z is a, like, uh, or the slide before that, you said if you sample, yeah, Z, like, um, uniform zero one, then when you invert it, you recover P of X. Mm -hmm. um, if, zero, if Z isn't, like, zero, uniform zero one, how do you, like, still maintain that guarantee? Well, if it's a CDF, if this flow you're working with is a CDF, then it won't. Uh, that, that's just not going to happen. Um, here, I haven't told you how I've trained the flow or defined the flow so that that is true for a non-uniform Z. Okay, so there's something special you have to do? Yeah, uh, that's going to be in the next oh. slide. Yeah. Okay, so th this is just to give you an idea of what a flow does. And th this is sort of the picture you should have in mind. Yeah. Uh, is the trained flow still monotonically increasing? Yeah, because it should always be invertible. So what you want to do is define the flow so that no matter what the parameters are, it's always an invertible function. So since it's in 1D, it always must be monotonic. So is the base distribution, uh, does the base distribution have some uh, a constraint? Because your flow is uh, monotonically increasing. Right. There can't, can't be any like, uh, base distribution. There, there should be some uh, constraint. Um, I think modulo weird mathematical stuff, you can pretty much have everything. Um, I think what matters, what matters is actually a practical constraint which is that we want it to be easy to sample from, and we want it to be, we actually want, it, want to have easy log likelihood evaluation. That's, that's just gonna be a practical thing. Okay, so that's a flow. How do you actually fit flows? Well, you fit them with maximum likelihood. You expected that because this is about likelihood-based models. Um, but how exactly do you fit a flow by maximum likelihood? Maximum likelihood is defined on the probability density. But we're no longer working with probability densities. We're working with flows. So that means we need to turn, we, we need to be able to calculate the probability density of a point under a flow. So what does that mean? Well, a flow defines a probability density over the data. How does it do so? It does so via its sampling process. So this is the sampling process of a flow. Um, you sample noise from the base distribution, like the standard normal or the uniform distribution, and you pass it through the inverse of the flow. That this is the sampling process. And because we have the sampling process, this implies a distribution over x. OK. Now, what is that distribution over x? So let, let's just try to think about it. So let's say z which is the noise, is uniform between 0 and 1. So that just means uniform between 0 and 1. And let's say the flow is like this. Um, so z, sorry. So the flow is defined like this, x equals 2z. In other words, using the notation from the previous slide, it would be z equals f of x, which is 1 half x. So this is a very simple flow. Apologies for my handwriting. Um, so what, what does this flow look like? So let's say z is this line between 0 and 1. And now x, which is the sample, will be on the line between one and two, right? We're just doubling, we're just doubling z. And so one will get mapped to two, one half will get mapped to one, um, this will get mapped there, and so on. This is the flow. It's invertible, right? You just divide and multiply. So this is a perfectly valid flow. So now this was the, this was the base distribution, so that means p of z is one. Now we want to ask ourselves the question, what is p of x? Well, just by looking at this diagram, you see that x is uniform, right? But it's uniform not, on, not over 0 and 1, 0 to 1, but 0 to 2, right? So that means p of x is actually 1 half. Okay. 
So what this tells us is that we have to do a little bit of trickery. It's not enough to take the flow and look up the density, the base density, at, at the point that it maps to. Right? You, you have to worry about how much the flow stretches space. Right? OK, so the, the reason you have to worry about how much the flow stretches space is because probability mass must be conserved. So we know that the amount of probability mass over here is 1. That, that's, how much, that's how much mass you always get. But the probability mass over here must also be 1, because it's, the flow is deterministic and invertible. Um, so that means we have to correct the density to account for stretching by the x-axis. So here's the general formula for how to do so. This is the flow. And if you ask yourself, how do you compute the probability that the flow sample lands in a little area? So what is the probability that the flow sample, x, lies in some range, let's say x naught to x naught plus epsilon? Or I'll say, plus dx. This doesn't really mean anything, but you, you know what that means. Um, the, the probability that this, this is true of this event is, well, that's the density at x times dx. But we also know that this event, because the flow is invertible, this event is entirely equal, is, is equal to the probability that z lies in the interval f of x to f of x plus, or sorry, f of Okay, where, where dx is just something really small. So that, because this interval is also infinitesimal, that's also equal to p of z. Times now the length of the new interval. So the length of the new interval is the derivative of the map times the length of the input interval. Right? So that's equal to what we say f prime of x times dx. I think most people have seen this kind of logic before. Right? And so that's exactly where this formula comes from. This says that the density at x is equal to the, the density at the base distribution times how much the flow stretches space. The more flo the flow stretches space, the more likely that point was to be sampled under the base distribution. So that's why the probability should be larger. OK, so that's, that's how you fit flows in 1D. That, that's how that works, assuming that you can actually parameterize them. Um, so how is this related to the whole CDF thing? Well. We know that the CDF is a flow from the data to a uniform distribution. And so why don't we take this formula and write it down for a CDF and just see what happens. So we have something like z is equal to a CDF of x. And this is a parameterized CDF. And well, we have that the probability density at a point is the density at z under the base distribution plus log derivative of the flow, which is the CDF, so the derivative at x. Right, this is the same exact formula, except I just took some logs. Now, the base distribution for CDF flows is uniform. So that means the log is 0. And what's the derivative of a CDF? That's just the PDF, right? 
So these are all parameterized. OK, so this is kind of reassuring. If we think of a CDF as a flow from data to a uniform distribution, and we apply this formula for maximum likelihood for flows, then we get just maximum likelihood for probability densities. So this is nice. Uh, if this did not happen, then we should be worried. OK, so that, that was a quick introduction to flows in one dimension. Um, the idea is that instead of working with probability density functions, we're going to be working with flows from data to noise. The reason we do so is because it, would, it helps us generalize to neural net architectures that work with high dimensional data. All right, and that's exactly what we're going to talk about now. It's this generalization. OK, so instead of transforming these funny looking Gaussians into other Gaussians, uh, we want to transform high dimensional data, like these pictures of dogs, into high dimensional Gaussians. Uh, one thing to note is that because we do this with flows, these flows are invertible and they're going to be differentiable, this necessary, we, we must have that this noise distribution, this, this, these noise variables have the same dimension as the data. This is just something that we're going to have to work with because of how flows are defined. So this is something to keep in mind. And this is also a restriction that other models will not have. Uh, those are going to be called VAEs. Uh, but this is something that we're going to be working with. And also keep in mind that, again, once we have a flow trained, we're going to be able to sample from this distribution here. It's going to be a high-dimensional Gaussian or a high-dimensional uniform distribution. And it's hopefully going to generate good-looking images for us. OK, so we can do the exact same exercise in uh, for maps, for invertible maps uh, between high dimensional spaces, not just one dimension. Um, and the story is exactly the same thing. You have, in order to calculate the probability density for some point x, you, well, you, you have the, the density under the base distribution, that's expected. And then you add in a contribution, which is how much space gets expanded as you map data to the latent space, as you map data to the noise space. So what does it mean for x to be likely? Well, let's say here's x in x space, and uh, it, it gets mapped to some point in z space. So here's z. So what it means for x to be likely is, first of all, if this point is likely under the prior. Let's just say it is. But also that if you draw a very small ball around x, that this ball gets mapped to a very large ball around z. That, that's, that's what this formula means. So what, why does this mean that x is likely? Well, if this ball is large, that means when we sample in z space, right? the sampling process means the sample in z space, so you sample some points like this. If the ball is large, then it's very likely for that sample to land inside this ball, which means that it's very likely for x to be a sample from the model. Right? That, that's what the, the meaning of this is. And in order to capture this notion, uh, we need something more than a derivative. We need the Jacobian matrix. So the Jacobian matrix uh, does this. What it does is it tells us if we have a small cube around x, well, locally, if the cube is very small, then the, then the, the flow will turn it into a parallelogram in z. And the determinant, of the, the determinant of the Jacobian, of the flow, uh, tells us the volume change, tells us the volume of this parallelogram. So that's, that's, how we, that's how we capture this idea. OK. And this is how we're going to train flows. This is how we're, we're, we're going to train them with maximum likelihood. And this is the formula that we use. And this is what happens when you train it with maximum likelihood. You just take the log, and you get this. OK, so I think already many of you can see the key issue uh, that we're going to be faced with when we're training flows, uh, which is that we actually have to be able to compute this determinant of the Jacobian. This is a really messy beast. The Jacobian is a d by d matrix, where d is the dimension of the data. And computing its determinant, well, you know, that's really slow. Uh, so somehow we're going to have to design models where this is always easy to do. And this is uh, one of the key design requirements that we have to keep in mind when you when we uh, design flows. 
But supposing we can do so, we can actually do a lot of cool things with flows. Uh, we can take many flows, like these, and we can compose them together. If we compose flows, we get a new flow. Um, and the, the formula for computing the log probability is very simple. You just add up all the, all the, determ the determinant terms. And this is going to be a very easy way to increase the modeling capacity of our models. Notice that this is something that we can never do with the discrete models. It's it doesn't really make sense to take two autoregressive models and stack them on top of each other and backprop through the whole thing. That just doesn't make any sense. But with flows, it makes perfect sense. Uh, so this is one instance of why you might want to use flows instead of the discrete models. All right, now let's try to make this a bit more concrete. Let's talk about the simplest case we can think of. Um, so let's say our flow from x to z, so this is z, is an affine function. An affine function is determined by a matrix, let's say an invertible matrix A, and a shift B. And let's say the base distribution is standard normal. So what is this? Well, really, this is just another name for a Gaussian, a multivariate Gaussian. Right, the covariance matrix is going to be like AA transpose or something like that. Um, and the mean is going to be B. So really, we've just re rephrased multivariance, multivariate Gaussians in a different uh, manner. Um, and uh, well, if you look at the log likelihood formula, uh, you, the Jacobian of this transformation is, uh, is A. And so the log likelihood involves this determinant of A. So if you've ever wondered why the multivariate Gaussian formula has a determinant in it, this is why. It's, it's a flow. And that's how flows work. Um, but this is going to be expensive when the dimension is large. Computing the determinant of matrices is going to be um, quite hard to do. Um, so that leads us to wonder if we can do something a bit easier. So this goes back to the first example of uh, diagonal Gaussians. Um, what if we designed our flow so that it acts independently over the different coordinates of the data? We can do that. Um, and this defines a perfectly good flow. Now, for each one of these flows, individual flows, these are going to be flows in 1D. Uh, so we can use anything we want. We can use invertible affine functions in 1D, or we can even use CDF flows. Uh, there are actually models that do this. Um, and the advantage of doing so is that the Jacobian is now a diagonal matrix. The, and the nice thing about diagonal matrices is that their determinants are very easy to compute. Just multiply the elements of the diagonal on the diagonal. Um, so this is an example of a very tractable and easy flow to work with. Yes? In this, in this setup, do you lose context of like what's nearby? Oh yeah, absolutely. So this flow can only operate on each element you know, each coordinate separately and it can't look at nearby coordinates. So that's going to be a huge problem. Um, so we're going to have to deal with that somehow and that's exactly what this slide is about. So now there's a very clever construction called a real NVP. Uh, this is, I think, one of the, uh, you know, very nice papers in this uh, field of flow models. So the idea in a real NVP is to take the variables, so here are the different Here are the different variables in your high dimensional data. And what you do is you split them in half. So here's one half, and here's another half. So I'll call this XL and XR to represent the groups. And so what you do in a real NVP is in order to come up with Z, you just let one half pass through unchanged. It's just an identity function. But the other half, gets transformed using a parameterized element-wise transformation, which is parameterized by XL. OK, so, so that's what happens here. See, this one half gets passed through unchanged. And now the other half gets passed through an element-wise affine transformation, where the parameters of that element-wise affine transformation are determined by the first part. See? OK, so the re what's very nice about this is that this is invertible. Um, so this is what the inverse looks like. Well, 
the first half that was unchanged, the, the inverse is you know, still the identity. Now the other half can be recovered from the input. So originally this was z in the other side, but that passed through unchanged. So you can just use the same thing, right? So imagine, how, how do you solve for x here? Well, you have to divide by, uh, well, you have to subtract out t and divide by s. These depend on x, which is a problem for the inverse, but x is equal to z. So it's, it works, you, you can get the inverse. So what's really nice about this is that this is a way of introducing arbitrarily large and arbitrarily expressive neural nets for S and T. You, you can design them however you like, and you can make them however large and crazy as you want. And the resulting transformation will still be invertible. So that's really cool. Um, you, you have no restrictions at all, yeah. Does it matter how you split the variables? It does in practice. That's gonna affect performance a lot in practice. That's what I was alluding to earlier on. Um, and that's gonna be trial and error. Okay, but not only is this thing invertible for arbitrarily crazy transformations, S and T, the determinant of the Jacobian is also tractable. And the reason is that if you write down the, deter if you write down the Jacobian, this is the Jacobian over here, well, the upper left block is going to correspond to this transformation. Since nothing happens, it's just the identity. This upper right block corresponds to how these z's, sorry, how, how these z's over here um, get affected by these x's. And the answer is they don't. This half, of, this half of the output does not get affected by the other half of the output, and that's why that's a zero. That's a block of zeros. Over here, there is an effect. So th this captures the, the effect of S and T. It's gonna be a very complicated term. And over here, this is the effect of, well, what happens, uh, what is the derivative of these Z's versus these X's? And that's very easy because we use an element-wise affine transformation. You can just read it off from the scales. Okay. so. This still seems kind of difficult because we have this nasty term over here, but it's a nice fact that determinants of triangular matrices are just given by the product of the diagonal, right? So you actually don't even need to worry about this term here. So you can always compute this, this determinant very easily. You just multiply all the S's, which is very cool. So a model that's built like this with a bunch of these flows stacked on top of each other, it's called a real NVP, and it actually works. Um, if you define these S and T transformations to be these large convolutional neural nets, um, and you stack a lot of these layers on top of each other and you just train using maximum likelihood, uh, you can get these models that generate reasonable looking images and seem to generate reasonable looking um, interpolations as well. It's very nice. All right, so I think this might have seemed kind of magical. Like, why, why, where did this transformation come from? Why, why is it invertible? Why is the Jacobian uh, determinant so nice? Um, the answer is that it actually comes from a very old thing, which is a base net. So given any base net over variables, you can actually construct a flow. And, you can, and that flow will automatically have a triangular Jacobian so that you can evaluate its determinant easily. Um, but I think we're out of time, so we will talk about that next time. <laughs>